Members, it is now time for question time and questions to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. I have to remind the House that uh, questions 6 and 12 have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Question number one, please. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask the junior Minister Ross to answer this question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our department has been working in close collaboration with the Victims and Survivors Service and the Commission for Victims and Survivors to develop a comprehensive, sustainable and responsive service which meets the needs of all victims. This has achieved significant improvements in the delivery of services, maintaining required levels of funding whilst improving and extending partnership working on the ground. This financial year, over $14 million has been allocated to victim services, demonstrating our continued commitment to ensuring that victims receive the best possible services. Mr. Eastwood for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the, the Minister for, for his answer? Um, given the fact that uh, the Victim Survivor Service has been named as a lead partner, um, along with his own uh, department, uh, in, a, in a project, a Peace Four project for delivering victim, uh, project for victims and survivors, the application is currently finishing, and the business plan, I think, is in. Uh, that's for 17.6 million pounds over three years. Uh, what is the Minister's view on what Thursday's decision is going to mean uh, for that £17.6 million and the impact uh, on victims? The member is right in terms of the, the total of £17.6 million uh, being allocated to the victims element of, of, of the Peace 4 programme. Um, the, the Victims and Survivors Service Stage 1 application was successfully approved by Peace 4 on the 11th of May. A detailed second Stage 2 application must be submitted uh, by today. Um, I recognise uh, why he raises the issue, uh, but of course he will understand that we have at least two more years of that programme that can run, given that Article 50 won't be uh, invoked immediately. Uh, we are planning to continue to make sure that we, we get the funding there uh, from that Peace 4 initiative, and in the meantime we will also be making sure that we have a more sustainable uh, programme moving forward so that, so that victims and survivors, uh, both individually and groups, uh, maintain levels of funding moving forward. Well, Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, thank you. I think I'm, I'm right in saying it's the junior minister's first question time. If so, may I welcome him to the House and wish him well. Uh, he'll be aware that there is a, a review uh, being commissioned uh, into the 10-year strategy for victims and survivors. Can I ask what input uh, his department has had into uh, drawing up and initiating that review and specifically to tell the House of the terms of reference uh, for the review? Well, that... Um collaborative design program has uh, been made up from both personnel from the, the department, from the Victims and Survivors Service and the Commission for Victims and Survivors to ensure that the development of an improved service delivery model is capable of meeting the needs of victims and survivors. Work will continue throughout 2016 and 17 to progress the strands of work and will seek an input from the sector in the redesign of the service delivery model. Um, there continues and there has been uh, extensive <coughs> engagement with the victim sector on how those services can be improved, including a series of workshops and, uh, which have identified a number of key priorities, such as a greater need for, for partnership uh, working. Um, the, recommend, uh, the recommendations of, of that report uh, will uh, make us, uh, will improve, I think, the, the service delivery model over the period of 17 through to 20. Uh, and we will work to continue throughout this year to progress the strands of work of that collaborative design project uh, and input will be sought from the sector on the development of the most appropriate service delivery model. Well, Ms. Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, can I also at this stage um, welcome the junior minister to his first question time and congratulate him on his, um, his role. Um, can I ask, as part of the service delivery to victims, could the junior minister um, outline what the mental trauma service um, will deliver? The member uh, will be aware that the Storm House Agreement included a number of, of commitments in terms of uh, victims and survivors. And the setting up of uh, a leading mental health service was announced by the former Health Minister on the 10th of September 2015. Uh, this position was reaffirmed by the Minister at a conference on 23rd and 24th of November. Additionally, initially, initial funding of 175000 for early setup costs the new mental trauma service was announced by the former Health Minister on the 24th of February of this year. Uh, this new mental trauma service model will support the delivery of an effective range of services delivered through an integrated service step care model and governed by a partnership agreement between victims and survivor service, statutory service and voluntary and community sector providers. Uh, that partnership agreement, Mr. Speaker, is currently under development and will cover areas including the interface between the voluntary and community sector 
and the Health and Social Care uh, Trust, um, referral protocols, linkages, monitoring and evaluation uh, and funding. Could I ask the Minister what engagements have taken place with victims and rep representative groups in services that have been provided? Uh, well, uh, um, on a regular basis, there is contact with uh, victims and survivors uh, groups uh, and indeed individuals. Uh, I know that I have uh, personally met with them. I know the First Minister has as well. Uh, that engagement is absolutely crucial in terms of making sure that we deliver services that are appropriate, and that engagement will continue over the months ahead. Just before we move on to Mr Douglas, could I ask a junior minister if he might adjust his mic? It's difficult for it to be picked up. Mr Sammy Douglas. Question number two, Mr Speaker, please. Substantial progress has been made in Belfast East with funding of £6.5 million committed. Completed projects include the Bryson Street surgery, which opened in April and has transformed a derelict site into a purpose-built community doctor's surgery, delivering vital health care to the local community. The Best of the East Visitor Centre also recently completed a refurbishment and opens in the coming weeks, providing a valuable tourism hub and social enterprise opportunities. Additionally, two revenue projects are in the process of procuring organisations to deliver services on the ground. These are the Community Education Project and the Employability Project. Work continues on the remaining projects. call Mr Douglas for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, the, Minister, the First Minister, for her answers thus far. And could I thank the First Minister for going out to, to the Bridges Centre recently? I'm sure she'll agree it's a smashing project. But could I also ask her, apart from East Belfast, could she update the House just the progress of the social investment fund right across Northern Ireland? Well, I did indeed uh, enjoy my visit uh, to the Bryson Street surgery. I, I think it is a wonderful example of what the uh, Social Investment Fund has been able to achieve uh, in various different places across Northern Ireland. And I've had the opportunity to go out and visit uh, those projects that have finished, and I look forward to visiting many more in the future. Uh, as I indicated to the committee uh, when the Deputy First Minister and I were before them uh, just a couple of weeks ago now, uh, the current project commitments have associated costs of over £70 million. Uh, spend from the 1st of April 2012 to the end of May 2016 uh, is over £10 million, expected to increase to over £30 million this financial year. And as of June 2016, 10 revenue projects have service delivery organisations appointed and have formally commenced delivery in local communities and they will have significant spend this year as they maximise the uh, number of participants over the next few months and deliver the services throughout the remainder of the year. So that's 10 revenue projects. Uh, a total of 21 capital projects have commenced uh, either detailed design or construction and are incurring uh, associated costs. So this is therefore a big spend year for the social investment fund and I think is also very much reflective of the progress that has been made over this last year. Well, Mr. Alex Atwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I first of all welcome the Junior Minister? I think there's a widespread view that, as Justice Chair, he went some way towards earning that particular uh, nomination. Could I ask the First Minister, though, uh, is there any plans in her head or in her department uh, for a SIF 2? Is it not better that that approach to neighbourhood renewal is delivered through neighbourhood renewal? And does she agree with me that even neighbourhood renewal is now in jeopardy? given its reliance upon European funding, which is clearly going to be uncertain come two years from now? Well, at the moment, and thank you very much for uh, confirming my wise decision in relation to my junior minister. Uh, I will take that uh, from you, Minister Atwood. Um, in terms of uh, uh, an SIF2, no, there, are, there aren't any plans for an SIF2 uh, at present. We're still very much engaged in making sure that we deliver in terms of SIF1. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that that is happening now. We do recognise that uh, because it was new, because it was innovative, because it was imaginative, uh, it did have uh, some teething problems. But those issues are being dealt with, and they're being dealt with very effectively now. Uh, and therefore, uh, we want to encourage uh, those participants in SIF 
uh, to continue to work with our officials and to make things happen on the ground. I have to say, in terms of the capital projects, you can touch and feel them, but for, for me, some of the most exciting projects under SIF has actually been uh, the revenue projects, uh, making sure uh, that people are employable in areas where uh, people may have difficulties finding employment. I think those are going to be great legacy projects, and I look forward to seeing them rolled out. Well, Mr. Stephen Farry. Mr Speaker, does the First Minister recognise that a number of government departments that dealt with deprivation and skills actually had their budgets cut more severely in order to create the social investment fund and that indeed they are actually better placed to spend money uh, efficiently and, and effectively and also with stronger governance than the situation that prevails with the, with the social investment fund at present? And of course, uh, Mr Farry fails to recognise that we are in a different era now. We are in an era of working right across government, uh, where the programme for government uh, has very firmly been put out uh, in terms of outcomes. Uh, and that is something that the Deputy First Minister and I feel very strongly about, that we want to see outcomes as opposed to processes. Uh, and therefore, this SIF um, uh, programme, I think, will give us uh, outcomes right across uh, government departments. Uh, he, he refers to other government departments might have been better placed. That's not the era that we're in now. We're in an era of joined up government, making sure that everyone knows where we want to be uh, in five and ten years' time, and we're going to use programmes like this to deliver on that. Well, Mr. Alex Maskey. Thank you, Could I, uh, Thank the Minister for her responses so far. Could I ask the Minister, Lucius has begun to address some of these matters, but could the Minister uh, outline some of the very positive impact that the SIF programmes have had on local communities? Well, as I've indicated, some of the revenue projects, I think, are very exciting. Um, in terms of employment-focused projects, uh, we're investing $18.5 million. Uh, and through that, we're currently supporting over 500 people through training and paid work placements. 5.7 million has also been invested in early intervention projects across the SIF zones, and almost 1,200 participants are already availing of those services. And um, some of the uh, feedback from parents has been so encouraging insofar as we're changing behaviours uh, of young people who otherwise may have even found themselves uh, in, in care. It's, a, it's as radical as that, and uh, I think we should be very proud of the fact that we're helping those young people to realise their potential. Uh, and of course, another area that we're focusing on is in education and uh, uh, with maths and English support at key stage two and three, uh, and indeed literacy support for primary school children. Again, we're making a very practical difference to the lives of those young people. Well, Mr. Philip Smith. Question three, please. Between the 1st of January 2011 and the 17th of June 2016, our department received 763 valid Freedom of Information requests, of which 373, or 49%, were answered within 20 working days. Mr. Smith, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her answer. Uh, but given that during the last mandate, the office under its former title, OFMDFM, found itself at the top of the list of complaints, made to the Information Commissioner regarding executive departments. What plans have they put in place to ensure public confidence and transparency within the department? Well, again, we hope that, uh, and indeed I believe that we have started uh, on a good footing uh, already in this mandate. Uh, currently, there are four requests which are under consideration, and of those, none have gone beyond the 20 working day deadline. So I think we've made uh, a good start. Uh, I think it's also recognised that in OFM, DFM, it's not like another department. Um, we do receive a lot of uh, requests which are sensitive in nature, uh, many of them very political uh, in nature, and we have to give them all due consideration and make sure that we're answering them uh, in, in the appropriate way uh, for the person that's asking and making the response in terms of freedom of information. <coughs> also, uh, it has to be recognised, and it's a political reality, uh, that it has to be agreed uh, between two political parties as well in terms of the ministerial input uh, in relation in releasing the Freedom of Information request. So I think we've made a good start. We recognise that there have been difficulties in the past and we're determined to try and deal with those issues in the future. Well, Mr Ian Mill. Thank you, Minister, for your answer thus far. Could I ask uh, what, measure, what measures have been taken to uh, 
to improve performances even further? Well, as, as everyone is probably aware, um, senior civil servants must approve draft responses to FOI requests, and departmental directors have been uh, directed that they must allocate sufficient resources uh, to ensure that FOI requests are responded to within uh, the statutory time scales. We are very much aware of the difficulties of the past and we are trying uh, to deal with those. We have also put in place enhanced systems for tracking uh, and monitoring requests um, uh, uh, to make sure that we encourage adherence to deadlines. And the FOI performance is also uh, Mr. Speaker, reviewed at a weekly senior uh, management uh, meeting. So we have put in place measures to try uh, and deal with issues that have arisen in the past. Well, Mr. Paul Garvin. Question number four, please. We are continuing to make good progress uh, on implementing the commitments we made in a fresh start. We are due to meet the Secretary of State uh, and the Irish Government on Wednesday afternoon to discuss implementation, after which it is our intention to publish a progress report. We believe, we believe that we have a good story to tell. In the last few weeks, for example, we have published the three-person panel report on disbanding paramilitary groups and appointed the co-chairs of the New Flags Identity, <coughs> Culture and Tradition Commission. We will also be finalising the membership of the Civic Advisory Panel shortly. Mr Garvin for supplementary. Thank the First Minister for her answer so far. Uh, in, in relation to the Fresh Start Agreement, uh, reference was made in relation to corporation tax on how this would be uh, delivered. But as a consequence of the uh, referendum vote and the outcome on Friday, uh, would the First Minister agree that the Azores judgment, uh, which would have had a major financial impact upon Northern Ireland, uh, is no longer a, a priority? Well, of course. Um uh, one of the difficulties in terms of corporation tax uh, was that we were going to have to pay for corporation tax out of our block grant allocation uh, because of a European Union um, ruling, uh, the Azores judgment. Uh, we will now want to explore uh, with Her Majesty's Treasury uh, as a matter of some urgency because, of course, we have committed uh, to the devolution of corporation tax by April 2018. What impact? Um, the decision on Thursday has in relation uh, to that removal from our block grant. We will want to uh, try and look at the affordability piece on all of that. Uh, so I, can I assure the member that that is uh, one of the issues that we wish to uh, speak to the Prime Minister and indeed Treasury around. Uh, and it's one of many issues, but it is one of the issues that we have on our radar. Mr. Dacke Mackay. Right, I can't clear. Um, can I ask the First Minister uh, if she could give us a more detailed update on the Civic uh, Advisory Panel, uh, and would she agree as well that as we now face into what is undoubtedly a political and economic abyss, that it is more important than ever that we do hear from civic voices within society as well as political leadership? Well, uh, in terms of the first question around the Civic Advisory Panel, uh, I can uh, advise the member that the Deputy First Minister and I have been uh, speaking about this for uh, a number of weeks now, and we hope to be able to make an announcement in relation to the panel uh, within uh, the coming weeks. So that's something that is really um, uh, in discussions at present, in active discussions at present, as I say, we have made good progress in relation to the paramilitary panel. We have made good progress in relation uh, to the Flags and Identity Commission. Uh, we look forward to working uh, with that commission indeed. But it is not surprising to know that I actually believe that what we have at the moment is a, a huge moment of opportunity, a huge moment of ambition and potential, uh, and it is up to us uh, in the Executive Office to make sure that we are well equipped uh, to deal with that potential and ambition. And already uh, my ministerial colleagues are tasking their officials uh, to look at where Europe has been a drag uh, on our competitiveness, on our flexibility, on our ability to do business in an innovative and imaginative way. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from ministerial colleagues around all of those issues, because of course that will form uh, part of how we move forward uh, in Northern Ireland as a part of the United Kingdom. Well, Ms. Nicola Mullen. 
Speaker, um, can the First Minister confirm if it is the case, as London clearly sees it, that any negotiation on second round effects of the devolution of corporation tax is off the table in the event of the devolution of corporation tax? Well, of course, uh, they were being quite uh, aggressive in relation to those issues, but because of uh, the vote on Thursday, that issue in relation uh, to second round impacts, never mind the cost, is something that we will want to revisit. Uh, and I'm sure the Finance Minister will want to look at all of those issues. So this actually gives us an opportunity, Mr Speaker, to revisit those issues where we were having difficulties around the second hand effects. Call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the First Minister guarantee that the actual action plan to tackle paramilitarism will be published by the end of June, that's Thursday of this week, as committed to on page 17 of the Fresh Start Agreement? Well, certainly it's our hope that we will have it uh, by then. We are working uh, with our colleague, the Justice Minister, ha to have the action uh, plan in place. Uh, I think we have received uh, a draft of that and we're discussing that at the moment, and we hope to discuss it further uh, at the Executive Committee on Wednesday of this week. Call Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions five and seven together. There is, current, there is no current agreement on the Mays Long Cash site issues. It is a prime site in a key location, and we hope we can find a resolution that will see the site developed. Mr. Butler, for a supplementary. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Perhaps the First Minister can outline <clears throat> the level of engagement that she has had with potential investors for that site, where we were once told there was the potential to create 5,000 jobs. And of course, there is great potential in the Mays Long Cash site, but unfortunately, there uh, isn't uh, a political agreement as to how we move forward uh, at present. That does not mean uh, that nothing is happening on the site, and he will be in particular aware of the yet again fabulous uh, Royal Ulster Agricultural Show, uh, which happened on the Mays Long Cash site in, in May just past uh, of this year. And as with the three previous shows, this year's show was regarded as extremely uh, successful. Attendance figures are not yet available, uh, but the corporation has indicated that in excess of 100,000 people attended this year's show. So whilst uh, we still continue uh, to hope that we can find a resolution in relation to the future development of the MLK site, there is still activity happening on the site. Well, Mr. Trevor Long. Mr. Speaker, I thank the First Minister for her answer. Um, given that the Mays project was originally to benefit from considerable EU funding, Indeed, we lost a tranche of funding due to our inability to agree about this in the past. How does the executive expect to fund future investment if there is no EU funding available in the future? Uh, well, to be blunt, other funds are available. Uh, and uh, whether that's in relation to private funding or indeed other investors coming in uh, from other parts of the world, of which actually there has been interest shown in the MLK side. But we need to find a way forward in relation to the MLK site. Uh, I recognise that, the Deputy First Minister recognises that, uh, and therefore for us it is something that we need to grapple with and get down to dealing with in the near future. Call Ms Carla Lockhart. Thank the First Minister for her answer. Will the First Minister agree to engage in further discussions about the MLK site to see if a solution can be achieved which can commu command community support and will allow the site to be developed in the future? Well, absolutely. And uh, the Deputy First Minister and I do intend to have further discussions in relation to the MLK site, uh, probably uh, over the summer uh, and into the autumn. Uh, it is something that is very much in our entree, uh, and we recognise the potential of the site, and it's because we recognise the potential of the site uh, that we want to make good things happen on that site. So, yes, we will engage again to make sure that that happens. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Does the First Minister continue to share the view to which her predecessor was brought in August 2013 that there is no prevailing basis upon which the Peace Centre can proceed at the maze? Is that still her position? Uh, yes, that is still my position. <laughs> Call Mr. John O'Dowd. Uh, Mr. Speaker, question number eight. 
a Delivering Social Change framework programme led by the Department of Health and jointly funded with Atlantic Philanthropies focuses on the issue of dementia services and includes a package of dementia projects that aim to transform the commissioning, design and delivery of dementia services. The programme makes a significant improvement in the quality of care and support for people, which particularly affects older people, to maintain their independence and live independently with the condition for as long as possible, and delivers an improved understanding of dementia in wider society. The policy responsibility for older people transferred to the Department for Communities on the 9th of May. For her response, and clearly dementia is an issue of a topical debate and concern to many in our society. Uh, can I ask the, the Minister to detail some of the elements of the programme? Absolutely, and uh, dementia, I think, has affected every family, uh, not unlike cancer um, in Northern Ireland, and I do very much welcome the work that is ongoing uh, through this project. Uh, it consists of three discrete work streams. The first is uh, in terms of raising awareness, uh, information, and support. Uh, the second is uh, training and development uh, and delirium. And uh, the third is in terms of short breaks and support to carers, because I think we all recognise, in particular in, in and around the support to carers, that that is a very fundamental piece of work because we're all too aware of the mental stress that is put on those people who are caring for a loved one with dementia and therefore they need help, they need support, uh, they need to get away uh, and have a respite and therefore uh, we very much uh, welcome the support to carers that has been delivered uh, by all five trusts but led by his own Southern Health and Social Care Trust and um, three providers have now been appointed uh, to cover the other four trust uh, areas in the contract uh, for the southern area has also just recently been uh, advertised with a closing date on the 4th of July 2016. So uh, it is in place, it is working, and I value the work that it does. Oh, Mr. Philip Logan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the First Minister uh, where does she see the future for the Delivering Social Change programme? Well, I believe the um, the Delivering Social Change project uh, and, and the programme has really pioneered uh, the co-design uh, uh, way of doing things and the whole partnership approach uh, that has been engaged in, uh, in that project uh, is actually helping us uh, to develop the way in which we want to roll out the programme for government framework and uh, it's very much uh, the programme for government framework is very much reflective uh, of the principles and the objectives uh, of delivering uh, social change. It really has led the way uh, for the outcomes focused programme for government and I think also uh, really does offer uh, real potential to guide further changes that we want to see emerging in respect of the programme for government. So it has worked well. We're going to use the processes now to help us to deliver on the programme for government uh, whilst engaging still with uh, our partners in Atlantic Philanthropies. Well, Mr Oliver McMullen. Uh, question nine. Steps for the establishment of the Civic Advisory Panel were set out in the Stormed Agreement and Implementation Plan. It anticipates a panel of six people, with members including the Chair being identified and appointed by uh, then OFMD FM, now the Executive Office, and the panel being tasked by the Executive with uh, considering specific strategic issues relevant to the programme for government and reporting to the Executive, although it may also propose subjects that it wishes to consider and seek agreement uh, from the Executive to do so. Uh, as I've indicated, consideration is currently being given to identifying and appointing panel members. Mr McMullen for supplement. Can I thank the Minister for, for her answer? Can, can the Minister tell us how this new body differ from the previous Civic Forum? Well, the Civic Forum, uh, which operated uh, for just two years between 2000 and 2002, uh, was uh, not then reconvened when devolution uh, was restored in 2007. And at that time, back in 2000-2002, the purpose of the forum was to provide views on social, economic uh, and indeed cultural matters. Uh, the Stormont House Agreement provides for the establishment of a civic advisory panel as a new model uh, for civic engagement. I think it will be uh, more focused uh, because it will be a lot smaller. 
uh, and it is envisaged to be based on uh, a non-statutory basis and every effort uh, as well is going to be made in order to minimise the administration costs in, co uh, in connection with the new civic panel. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Ms Nicola Mallon. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, does the First Minister accept that the people of Northern Ireland have expressed their democratic will and sent a clear instruction to both uh, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister that they want to remain in the EU? Can the First Minister outline how she intends to act on that mandated instruction? Well, of course, the mandated instruction wasn't to this place. The mandated instruction uh, was to the United Kingdom Parliament, uh, because, as I think Mr Allister uh, pointed out in an intervention earlier on today, uh, when we voted on Thursday, we were asked a question as to whether we wanted the United Kingdom uh, to leave the European Union or uh, to remain. And I do, of course, accept uh, that the majority of people in Northern Ireland, mostly in the west of the province, which I represent, um, decided that they wanted to, to remain within the European Union. There's no real surprise there. Uh, at the beginning of the referendum campaign, uh, we were told that uh, up on 75% uh, would vote to remain uh, within the European Union. As it turned out, uh, it was 55% uh, or 56% uh, and 44%. Uh, and I've heard a lot said today, uh, principally from uh, the members' uh, party, about respecting. Uh, the 55% uh, who voted remain, and I will, as will the Deputy First Minister, respect uh, that view. But she has to also respect the view that 44% of people here in Northern Ireland voted to leave. Uh, and in terms of the United Kingdom, which is the member state uh, which actually engages with the European Union, they voted to leave. So we can talk about all these different computations, but the campaign is over. The vote has been taken, and now our focus uh, in the executive, uh, and particularly between the Deputy First Minister and myself, is to make sure that Northern Ireland's best interests are preserved in terms of the negotiations to leave. Well, Ms. Mullen, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I welcome um, the fact that our First Minister um, respects that democratic view, but I think what people want to know here is how is she going to act on what was her clearly expressed democratic will? Well, you know, uh, before, uh, in fact, right back at the time when I indicated from my own party position uh, what our party position would be, I said also at that time something that I repeated at the Executive Committee just a couple of weeks ago with the Deputy First Minister, that whatever the outcome of the referendum, I would, after the referendum, work for the good of all of the people of Northern Ireland in any negotiations that would take place. And I know that there are a lot of people in Northern Ireland who are disappointed. There are a lot of people who are angry. Uh, there are a lot of people who have made all sorts of terrible prophecies of doom. And if others want to engage in naval gazing, that's fine. My focus, my focus is on doing what's right for all of the people of Northern Ireland in terms of the negotiations that will be coming up very soon. I call Mr Alex Maskey. Can I ask the First Minister, would, uh, would she join with myself and indeed many others uh, in assuring our migrant communities that uh, the day and the contribution which they bring to our society will be uh, much appreciated and welcomed uh, continuing in the future in the context of the EU referendum result? Well, I absolutely want to take the opportunity and I thank him for giving it to me, although I was probably going to touch on it uh, during uh, my wind-up to the debate, which is coming up soon. I want to reassure them that we absolutely value uh, what they give to Northern Ireland and what they have contributed uh, to Northern Ireland. I don't think anyone, uh, uh, any right-thinking person would say anything different because we recognise how they have come into our society, how they have integrated and how they are helping us to develop in an, in an economic way. Jamaski for a supplementary. Uh, I can thank the First Minister for that response, and obviously I, I did expect that, and I very much appreciate it. But would the First Minister again uh, appeal to all other parties and all other representatives to equally make it very clear publicly and where the need to do that, that those migrant uh, residents here are very, very welcome? Absolutely, um, and uh, it's something that we should send out a very strong message from here today. The vote on Thursday was to leave the institutions of the European Union. It was not to leave Europe. 
and therefore we have very close ties with the peoples of Europe and those close ties will continue. Well, Mr Gordon Lyons. Mr Speaker, does the First Minister agree with me that as a consequence of last Thursday's uh, vote, there are now many new opportunities uh, for this uh, Assembly as a result uh, of the powers that will be brought back that were previously ceded to the European Union? Uh, well, yes. Um, and, you know, over the weekend, and this is a, maybe a sad reflection on me, I'm currently reading a very good book, which I recommend uh, to all members, uh, by John Bew on uh, Viscount Castlereagh. Uh, and when he was um, developing plans for the Act of Union back in 1799 and 1800, he talked about the potential and ambition uh, that could come with the Act of Union. And likewise, I absolutely fundamentally believe that this vote gives us the opportunity for ambition, for innovation, for flexibility, and for imagination. And I hope everybody steps up to the mark and takes that opportunity. Mr Lyons for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her response. Will she also uh, agree with me uh, and note uh, that, the, that this morning the European Commission has said that the Republic of Ireland cannot abolish water charges and that it is only by leaving the EU that Northern Ireland can impose the threat of imposed water charges? Well, we were aware uh, that there was a threat uh, from the European Union that they were going to insist that we brought in some charging uh, for water services in Northern Ireland. And I have to say, the fact that that threat has now been lifted uh, by the very fact that we're leaving the European Union is something I very much welcome. It's something that we have opposed. Uh, it's something that we have opposed um, uh, and just recently opposed in our manifesto uh, again during the Assembly elections. Uh, and I note what has happened, uh, that the Republic of Ireland has been told by the Commission that they cannot get rid of water charges. Uh, and that's something to ponder on for everybody on the opposite side. Well, Mr. Nelson McCausland. Um, thank you. Could I ask the um, First Minister, does she agree with me, that one of the important benefits of an exit from the European Union is that Northern Ireland would no longer be bound by European Union state aid rules, which have been negative and restrictive, and that it would enable us to support in a way that we haven't been able to uh, before uh, support our local industries uh, in building up their employment and their capacity. Absolutely, and uh, I have been obviously listening intently uh, to the debate uh, around um, the European Union uh, and uh, the UK's exit from it. And I note that Mr. Beggs was talking about F.G. Wilson and uh, mentioning uh, the manufacturing that went on there. Uh, and in the past, we have been constrained by state aid rules in relation to when we could step in and, and help companies. And we have been constrained by energy policy in relation to our manufacturing companies, and we all know that. Uh, we've been constrained in relation to the mobile and broadband market. When can we intervene? When can we help? Uh, because there are state aid rules. Uh, and indeed, um, I, I think it was Mr Aiken mentioned the air passenger duty issue as well, and the, the fact that uh, we, in an attempt to allow us to increase connectivity, we have been really constrained in terms of what we can do uh, to help airlines and airports. So there are opportunities. They do, of course, all have to be costed, and I recognise that fully. I'm not suggesting uh, that we have a free hand to do everything that we would wish to do, but there's more flexibility now, and I think that's something that we need to explore. Call Mr McCausland for supplementary. Um, will the First Minister therefore undertake to explore as fully as possible uh, what opportunities there are to make Northern Ireland and indeed the United Kingdom as a whole much more economically uh, competitive and uh, in that context also what, uh, consider what can be done to rebuild our uh, fishing industry here in Northern Ireland? Well, I think uh, in particular, and uh, uh, this is something I mentioned on Friday, uh, those people engaged in the fishing industry will very much welcome uh, the vote that happened uh, last Thursday because they have been given uh, back some control over something that has been really constrained uh, over this past period of years, particularly uh, when our agriculture minister was out uh, at the fisheries uh, meeting in December. So they will very much welcome that. But I do know that uh, other ministerial colleagues are uh, talking to their officials, asking them to assess uh, where we can be more flexible, where we can be more competitive, uh, and I welcome that, and as I said before, I look forward to receiving information in relation to how we can take that forward. Call Mr. Paul Frey. 
Speaker, if I could lift the doom and gloom of some of our members in this House uh, today and bring light relief to the Chamber, if I could ask the First Minister if she will take this opportunity to congratulate the Northern Ireland team yeah. on their performance at the European Championships and pay tribute not only to the manager and the team, but all the support staff that makes it happen. Well, first of all, um, because I'm in this privileged position, I had the opportunity to go out and be with the, the team uh, on two occasions. And uh, let me say this, I am so proud uh, of Michael O'Neill, and I am so proud of the Northern Ireland football team, uh, particularly, uh, of course, I have to mention Michael McGovern, yeah. uh, being from uh, my hometown of Enniskillen. I think he has, my goodness, that game with Germany was difficult to watch. Uh, I think I was behind the settee for most of it. Uh, but it was a, an absolutely fabulous masterclass uh, in football. And uh, I do want to take the opportunity to thank the support staff as well. I think they have been marvellous in the way in which they have supported the team and indeed have provided information out to all the fans as well so that we know what's going on uh, through social media. I think they had a marvellous social media campaign uh, and it allowed everyone to keep in touch. Mr Free for a supplementary. Mr Speaker, I would take the opportunity now to thank the First Minister and indeed the Chief Whip for allowing me the time off to follow my dreams. <laughs> uh, but does the, does the First Minister agree with me that the fans that were both out in France and indeed remained here in this uh, country, in this province, done this country proud and sent messages and a lasting legacy not only in France but throughout this very world? Well, I, I think the... And my goodness, at the start of the tournament, I think there was a lot of concern about fans and because of some of the threats that were around, uh, and particularly, let's be honest, with the English fans and the Russian fans. But I'm very pleased to say uh, that the Northern Ireland fans and the Republic of Ireland fans both played a marvellous role. They were both brilliant. Um, and they really did lift the spirits. Will Griggs on fire is now <laughs> trending in France. Who would have ever thought it? Uh, and poor Will didn't even get a kick of the ball. Uh, but that just shows the quirkiness uh, of our fans. And I want to thank them. Um, and I know there's many behind me who were out uh, in France as part of the fans. Uh, thank them for their positivity uh, and their professionalism. I do, of course, also want to reflect on the fact that two fans lost their lives uh, when they were in France. And indeed, uh, it was really very sad uh, to watch the images of Darren Rogers' funeral uh, and uh, indeed the other gentleman who, who died uh, of a heart attack. So we do recognise uh, that there have been moments uh, of great sadness as well during the campaign. Uh, but we hope that their families take some comfort from the fact uh, that they're part of a much wider family. Well, Mr. Jerry Carroll. Mr Speaker, uh, having met the families last week, would the First Minister agree with me that the families of the Ballymurphy Massacre, who have been campaigning since 1971 for justice, have the right to justice for their families, and would her office uh, do all that they can to uh, assist them in their pursuit for truth and justice? And indeed, there are many families right across Northern Ireland who still pursue truth uh, and justice. Um, I think it's one of the saddest indictments on society in Northern Ireland that so many people who had loved ones cut away and um, murdered um, that they will never uh, be able to have uh, justice and closure. I spent some time with families yesterday in Killam in Castle Derg, people who lost loved ones to terrorism along the uh, Tyrone border and I, my message to them then was this, I will not allow the past to be rewritten. Uh, and that of which I am very, very clear on. Uh, there are some attempts to do that, and I will not countenance it. Mr. Carl, first supplementary. The First Minister for her response. And Mr. Speaker, the Ballymurphy families have been campaigning for justice for over 40 years since the massacre was, commi massacre was committed. And 11 innocent victims were shot down over a three day period in cold blood uh, by the state and their families have yet to receive any recognition of the atrocities committed at the hands of the state or indeed any legal redress for the crimes uh, carried out. And the years of grief and suffering 
for the, the families are a shocking indictment of a state which has sought Mr. to rape its hands clean. A question? I'd just like to ask the First Minister, uh, would she uh, support the call for an independent international investigation examining the circumstances surrounding all these deaths? Thank you. Well, of course, the dealing with the past part of um, the fresh start is something that we regret was not able to be taken forward at that time. Uh, we are engaged in trying to move that forward. I am hopeful that we will be able to move that forward. And then all victims, and indeed those who have suffered uh, in a very real and tangible way, will be able to get closure uh, in relation to their issues. Time is up. We now 